Greetings, Minecrafters, and welcome to another exciting and hopefully intellectually stimulating conversation uh, today, another Minecraft topic. And my name is Dr. Kimberly Quinn, and I am so super pumped, elated to talk about your emotional home. And this is one that hits quote unquote home for me, uh, which is why I think I'm just really excited to do it. So really, we want to start out there with you know, sort of the statement this, that, uh, you know, that is the quality of my life, the quality of my life is a reflection of my emotional habits. This is because as we, you know, the main mantra of Minecraft, right, which is, you know, become the boss of your brain, of course, but we're talking about thoughts come first, feeling second, actions or behaviors last. And so, we also need to realize that we are creatures of habit. So if we just kind of coast along on autopilot, you know, thinking the same thoughts, feeling the same feelings, behaving the same way, nothing, nada is going to change. And so the emotional home, I have not done this one before. And I was inspired by, I want to say, I forget it. I don't remember it was a while ago. Uh, probably it was Wayne Dyer. Not sure. Uh, but I've just got one. This is just going to roll out of me organically because it's, it's been really years of becoming aware of this. And this course is how it works, right? Our, in our midlife is when we kind of, you know, uh, kind of like, you know, receiving those wisdom bombs from all over the place because we, this is when we start to really put it together. And uh, the emotional home I can really relate to. Okay, so let's talk about what that is. So our emotional home is what we, kind of like our default network, in the brain where we, where we automatically just revert to whether, you know, it, it comes from a childhood injury for the most part, right? So whatever, you know, negative messages and how they made us feel, that becomes our emotional home. So it can be, you know, uh, definitely all the different voices of, of shame. And that's definitely mine and, you know, uh, deprivation and they can be regret and all uh, self blame. And they can, we can go on and on and on with, what your main thing is. And for me, my emotional home that I would resort to would be the, we don't want you feeling, we do not want you. And that's obviously from my, you know, cause of, you know, toxic messages that I received from, uh, you know, mainly my, my parents who are, you know, obviously if they're, if they're saying toxic things, behaving in a toxic way, they're obviously not feeling whole and complete underneath. And so it's not meant to judge. It's meant to, to have a discussion because I've long since let all that go and forgive it. And we've talked about that. And I share my, my personal stories because thank, thank goodness, you know, people along my path also share their personal stories and, you know, to feel is to heal. And when we share, to, to share is to care. And I don't usually speak in bumper sticker, though I'll say that it really did help me when people authentically who were further down the path than me shared their little tidbits and, uh, you know, uh, about different things. And it helped me to get, gain clarity in my own life. And so, and I've realized, cause we've talked about this too. Life continually gives us quizzes until we get it. You might even get a nine out of 10, which would be an A minus like a 90, right? I'm an academic. So I think that way that's still life is, you know, the universe, God source with the capital S, whatever you want is a higher power keeps kind of throwing that stuff at us until we get it in advance spiritually. And I can't tell you how many times I thought I had this. I thought I got a hundred on the test and it turns out I had like a, a 9.8 out of 10. So I almost had it. And it was once, you know, sort of recently, uh, about, a, about a year or two ago, a couple, a couple of years ago where, uh, it was just, you know, some, some pricklies and, you know, I, it really threw me for a bit and I didn't, it, I had to process it. I'm like, Oh my God, that quiz is back. So this is what we're going to talk about today is where this comfortable, we can be very comfortable, become very comfortable with, with unhealthy thoughts and feelings that probably doesn't see it's very counterintuitive, but if this is, or, and if this is what we've heard growing up, especially, you know, the time can be before we're two years old, we don't even have a lot of language then, but two year olds have feelings and they can, they can receive more language and they can express. So if, you know, if we've been in a situation where the attachment isn't, isn't very good, maybe mom or dad or dad and dad or whoever, 
weren't you know, very attentive. We're hearing toxic things. It's toxic things are being said to us. We're getting any kind of messages that were, you know, not wanted, not loved as much as we need to be. And they can, we can go down the whole road with all these different, all the different types of messages that we can receive. The point is, we, if we've had, you know, dysfunction in our, in our childhood like that, we, we learn what we need to do to get those good feels. We learn and, you know, we learn to navigate it. How do I get the good stuff? How do I get the, the love? It may not be love. It may just be attention. How do I get that? We learn at a young age how to kind of, you know, manipulate the system to get the good feels. And we revert back to these messages in our adult life. So when we talk about habits, you know, if we're talking about negative ones, you know, and I said, you know, name, you know, three habits, you might come up, not that they're yours, but you know, right away people might go to smoking. That's probably one of the most common, you know, unhealthy, bad habits that somebody might come up with. And then we can come up with, you know, a gamut of other ones, you know, being addicted to your cell phone or, or like that, or, or just, uh, people pleasing. We can go on and on with all different kinds of habits, right, right to, you know, uh, jumping straight for the junk food instead of the good snacks or whatever. And then we've got all that. We've got lots and lots of positive habits. You might have a little exercise regimen. When you wake up, you got a gratitude practice. When you wake up, you've got a, a really good habit of saying, please to meet you each and every time you meet someone new, it's, it's instilled in you since you were little, you can go on and on. So we, we can we know that we're creatures of habit, right? I just don't know that I, I don't know that I, that I believe that many people get that emotions can be habitual as well. We can, we can actually become addicted to feeling certain ways because we get payoff in it because we're used to letting those emotions roll right through. Then the brain continues to look for it. And then it's the same sort of hamster wheel as it is with any other habit. And unless we you know, become aware of it because the majority of this is unconscious. Unless we become aware of it, it's very difficult to throw a wrench in it to stop it. And I, I do know that Wayne, Wayne Dyer talks about this a lot, but so does, or Anne, so does Joe Dispenza. I also like him a lot. Uh, I go on little jags with people. Wayne Dyer is too pretty frequently. Joe Dispenza has also got great things to say. And I'm pretty sure that, no, I'm actually certain that, uh, Joe Dispenza says after, after about the age of 35, something about over 90% of our, of our thoughts are the same, basically. So if we continue to think the same things, thoughts come first, right? If we continue to think the same thoughts, and this is largely unconscious, which means we are not in touch with this. We're not in touch that we're doing this. So we, if we continue to think the same thoughts, we're going to continue to feel the same feelings. And then we're going to continue to behave in the same ways, attract the same circumstances and people and everything to us. And so it's same, same, same. And therefore, no kind of change is happening in our lives. And then we often look around and we're 50 or 60 or 70 or older and looking around like perplexed, like how come this all happened this way? Well, it's really not a big secret because if we don't, you know, sort of become actively engaged in our thought process, it's just going to continue to, to kind of play the same tape. That's how it goes. You know, so we're talking about to get out of the back seat of your life. You know, get, we got to become aware of what's, you know, circling around in the vault of the unconscious because otherwise, you know, feeling, you know, thinking the same thoughts. We, you know, we just said this, right? Feeling the same feelings day after day, week after week, year after year. And then the show is over, right? You know, I, and I say it a lot. I, I haven't, I feel like I have a sign in my office that says something like this. Life is now in session or something good. But I mean, the whole thing is it's not a dress rehearsal. This is the big game. This is it. So while we're just kind of hanging out on autopilot, you know, sitting in the backseat of our lives, allowing, you know, um, the current to just, you know, the current of the unconscious, the current of life just to carry us away. This is why most people's lives don't change that much. And then all of a sudden they hit, you know, this reflective point in their middle or late life and later life. And they're like, you know, why did, you know, like perplexed, I don't, it's not such a mystery, really, you know, it's just, you've allowed the same thing to continue. And so it's no big shocker that things stayed the same. So Joe Dispenza, you know, the, you know, he also my friend circle, I'd love to meet him too. And, and Oprah, of course, 
I love her. She's one of my, we were very close. She just isn't aware. And Wayne Dyer, she definitely was in our friend circle. And uh, God bless him. He left way too, he left us too early. And there's just so many good ones out there. Tony Robbins, I'm a big, big fan of Tony Robbins too. Say, he says the same things. So think about it. These, these incredible thinkers are all saying the same thing. And so, so Joe, Joe Dispenza is saying that awareness is key. Wayne Dyer says awareness is key. Oprah says awareness is key. Eckhart Tolle, same thing. Um, so we've got to realize that we are, are residing in the same emotional home. We all have a home base, and we return to it like a homing pigeon until something shakes us up and wakes us up. So a, a good example would be an abusive relationship. Think of like a super, this is so stereotypical, but a super abusive, you know, codependent relationship where, you know, she's getting beaten up emotionally and or physically, goes right back to the same emotional home of worthlessness. And I deserve this. And he's going to change for me. And he's going to do this, go to counseling for me. And then, and then, you know, and this, and then the cycle happens and somebody gets her to break up with him or he takes off or the, there's a restraining order or whatever. And then, you know, a little bit of time goes by, probably not that much. And here comes another jerk showing up wearing a different outfit. And he's exactly the same. Because, she, because we teach people how to treat us and she is teaching people because of these feelings of unworthiness underneath and this comfortable emotional home of being mistreated and even abused that comes from childhood injury. She's become used to being mistreated, even though on some level she's intelligent, knows it's not okay, knows it's against the law even, and knows that, uh, it's not really making her happy. It's, it's a, it's a codependent dope fix. Because that's what it is. Which she, it's, we, because when we, when we return to our emotional home, we are, we are landing in that place of injury again, which we often try to medicate with codependency or alcohol or shopping or whatever. We want to medicate that wound. And obviously, it just doesn't work. So all the people pleasing and rescuing that codependents do is all not the same. Or, or sorry, is, is the same. When, when codependents try to self-medicate without... with uh, Sorry. Oh my goodness. When we try to self-medicate, I have a little sinus infection. That's what it is. We try to self-medicate with alcohol, shopping, sex, porn, um, cell phones, whatever, um, and codependency. We're trying to kind of ice ourselves from the pain of, of the injury that's underneath, which is, you know, uh, most often based in shame, right? That feeling of being defective, flawed, damaged goods, just not not good enough, you know, uh, it, it's just, it's that, just that feeling of just being, um, damaged. I, I can't think of a better way to say it. Shame is the, shame is the spiritual and emotional equivalent of drinking turpentine for breakfast instead of orange juice. That's how I describe shame. Shame just says I am flawed and defective in some way, damaged goods. Okay. So, so when we do any of these behaviors, that's just us trying to to, to, uh, soothe a really old wound. And obviously it doesn't work. So, so the emotional home here is for, for her is one of worthy, uh, um, worthlessness because she keeps, she, she just continues to think the same things, which leads her to feelings of worthiness, worthlessness, which leads her to the behavior of being in these bad relationships within which they confirm what she already believes to be true, which is that she isn't worthy of a good, healthy, loving, kind relationship. Then it all solidifies because the brain found what it was looking for. See, I'm not worthy. I told you. Rands back at the emotional home of unworthiness. And there we are. There we are. And to me, and these can be similar to, there's just so many different variations of what your message can be. For me, Mine very much relates to that one because it's based in shame. Though the 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 message is a little different, and I just I, I've had gosh I've had so many talks with my rooftop friend. Any of you who who read that Seven Days article a couple of years ago, my rooftop friend, she and I grew up together, and the rooftop name comes me it comes from we used to climb up on the roof really young, like six, and climb up on, onto the roof. Our our houses are right uh, behind each other. And we used to process the stuff, you know, going on in our lives. We were deep, deep seas. We didn't even realize it. You're six. You think everybody's like that. And in six and seven, we used to talk about all this stuff. So very recently, we talk every couple of weeks. 
we talking about what we're both sort of what we both continue to attract and the life quizzes and we talk about all of this very frequently that my emotional home and, and this message is very similar to the other one but based in shame because mine is we don't want you and I, as i mentioned earlier i you know I've, I've passed all these quizzes i'm so aware of it i'm really aware of it and even then i, I thought i was just all set and then another came along came another quiz and it was a couple years ago it was in the workplace there were just a couple of pricklies there it was and the story of of it isn't isn't as big as, as the message. It was like a, and it was just a prickly, petty, clicky thing that you wouldn't think would happen with uh, professional people. And and, and it, the, the story wouldn't, wouldn't be big for them, but it was big for me. And it was just a, a blatant, a blatant um, leaving me out of something. It was just very, very, the intention was strong. It, it wasn't my imagination. It was very, very strong. And a, a couple of others, uh, witnessed it. And, um, this, like, this goes back a few years and, and I, I went, I went home and I, I was, I was in the Jeep and I started to get teary. I'm like, what the heck? Cause it was really petty. The situation was pretty stupid, but the message was so deep and it, it hit me. It struck me on like a cellular level. And I knew not right in that minute, pretty close though, actually, because it's like, how did I let them yeah, how did I let them get in there? And it was another quiz of we don't want you with this little thing that was going on in the workplace. And I and I called my, I of course told my my husband, who's my very 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 best friend in the world, and and he he and we've talked about this too because we all have something. He said that's absolutely what it is. And I called my rooftop friend, and she said, oh, that's absolutely what it is. So even though what might what might have been, it was it was mean spirited. That was definitely mean spirited. That that isn't my imagination either. But it was petty and stupid, and it, I think if that weren't my emotional home, I might have. If it were someone else, they might have was been just like, "Well, screw you," you know. But for me, they kind of hit on. They really hit that that emotional home nerve, and so now I work through it, realize that's what it was, set myself tremendous healing energy. I prayed a lot on it, actually. Thank you, thank gratitude, thank you for healing me so much. And I feel like I just have to go two more millimeters, just two more millimeters. Thank you. I did a ton of gratitude around it. And then I'm going to share with you a visual that I did because it may help you with whatever your emotional home is because um, it's really, and this is sort of recent. That was about, that was a few years ago. And maybe it was maybe just a few months after that, where I came up with this visual for myself, kind of meditative, but I don't actually sit still and just envision it. I can be driving, I can be whatever. And I just, I think of it and it's been so helpful. So here's what I do because all that toxic behavior and all those, we don't want you memories are of being a child, just over and over, we're big, really strong, sometimes violent, just, just bad. What I do is I picture where my house was in this neighborhood. It was in a suburban New York neighborhood with houses on every side, um, you know, like, uh, you know, right next to each other sort of thing. And I picture where my house was kind of like a missing tooth. So I picture the, the, the road and it's Mr. So-and-so's house, their house, this house, that house with the cats, you know, whatever. And I picture the lot of my, of my, uh, home when I was a, a teenager, which actually had a beautiful view of a, of a small mountain range, even in the neighborhood. And I picture the house gone. It's not there. But what I picture is like gorgeous Vermont wildflowers. So, so it goes house, the lot with a beautiful flowers, a breeze, picture all the honeysuckles and the brown eyed Susans and, um, the little orange paint brushes. So it's, and the, those little purple ones, I don't know their name. And just, uh, it is, and they're kind of moving in the breeze. The other houses are all there, just not mine. And then I'm just kind of sitting or standing. Doesn't matter what age you are. I just, I'm whatever age. I have my favorite hat on sometimes. And I'm staring at this, um, there was a, there was a, um, like a stone structure on the top of one of the mountains in the distance. And I'm just kind of like looking over at that. And I actually feel safe where I, I didn't feel safe my entire childhood. Yet when I've, when I, I've changed the visual of my emotional home, with the wildflowers, again, like a missing tooth between the other houses, looking out at the view, and I can actually be there, stand there, sit there on that property in my mind's eye, and I feel 
100% safe and good and I'm flourishing and thriving. So now when I when I get that that quiz, I only got a 9.9, .9, not a 10, you know, and, and, you know, the universe or source is sending it back. I take myself right back there with where all those we don't want you memories are. And I just kind of stand there and soak up the, I don't, I don't need you to need, I don't need you to want me or need me. I don't need you. <laughs> I don't need you or want you. And I don't care what you think. I don't care anything, anyone thinks because I want me, I love me and I'm really good now. I'm all set and I throw some gratitude at it. I wouldn't want to relive it all, but I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful for all of those things. You know, how I came out on the end of all those things happening to me as a child, tons of, of gratitude for, for all the growth and all the depth and, you know, becoming a, a you know, a better, more empathetic human being because of all, all of that stuff that happened. Again, I don't want to relive it, but I'm very, very, very grateful for how, for how I sort of wound up as a, as a person. And I, I am happier in my skin than I've ever been. And so I just wanted to share that with you. Actually, I actually wrote some of this down. I don't often do that, but this one was so important to me because a light bulb went on and I thought, wow, when I came up with this visual, um, I was like, I got, I've got to get to, to this and, and share this with people because this may really help some of you to, to change that up where you can actually, uh, release yourself from an old, you know, from an old emotional home that's, that's toxic where these messages other people give you, which you're actually attracting until you heal from this. And then you, and then you can turn that stuff around, flip the script and be sitting, standing, walking through the wildflowers or however beach or however you, whoever you choose to change it and, uh, and just flip the script on that whole thing and change, change your emotional home and stop attracting any more mistreatment in your life. Okay, so this is a nice sort of natural wind up here. I truly, this was a heartfelt one for me. I mean, I feel them all. I feel them all. Of course, I just, I love uh, doing this podcast and also the YouTube channel and everything else I do that involves, you know, positive, po positivity and also, also have a thing which is sort of under the big umbrella of positivity, but helping, helping people to see their value. And I think this one today, hopefully, kind of touched on that for some of you. And I, I really do hope it was helpful. I like to share um, whatever inspiration, whatever wisdom that I acquire from anywhere, because again, people, so many good, kind people, you know, shared the, their lives, their experiences and their, and, and their wisdom with me, which is, um, you know, why I'm in such a good place. They allowed themselves to be vulnerable and and, and just and share some, you know, deeper stuff. And so I wanted to share that little, sort of technique that I, I learned to do a little, a little while ago. And it's incredibly helpful when, you know, somebody pushes a shame button of, we don't want you. I just say, okay, then beat me up, Scotty. And I land myself and now you don't even know. I used to drive past that exit in New York to see my, my, my rooftop friend and also I had friends in Jersey and stuff and I had to go by and I, I would wait, this is way back, like a few decades ago, I'd be coming back from college or whatever. And I would, I would roll by exit 18 on the New York, uh, throughway and feel like I was going to throw up all over the car. That's where I used to be just driving by that exit because that's how toxic my childhood was. And so there is definitely hope, hope for, for anyone who, who has a situation like that, because once you create that, that visual, I can, I'm telling you, I can literally in my, in my mind's eye, you know, walk through there as my 10 year old self in overalls, or I can walk through there in my baseball uniform, you know, and as little or in high school, I can walk through there as my 58 year old, 58 year old self barefoot in shorts, with my favorite travel hat, whatever. And look at that gorgeous view of, uh, of Mohawk Mountain House up there. Well, actually, it's not a, a Mohawk Mountain, not Mountain House. And Sky Top, which is that, that stone structure at the top, and, and and just feel completely, completely at peace. And so, okay, that's it. I wish you all the best. Thank you for listening. This is Kimberly Quinn, 
signing off from the beautiful northern Vermont. Have a mindful, healing day.